we're going to talk about a little bit about succession because I'm quite late on the boat of this. I've only jumped on it. I jumped on it only, I think, in second season when it was airing. Um, I kind of avoided that first because when I first saw it, I just thought it would be a bit long, drawn out, weird, boring, milk toast sort of series. But I was pleasantly surprised by how quickly it gripped me um, because of how narrow its focus was. I think that's mostly what it is. When I, I think I like series where they're so narrow. They only talk about one side of life. They depict it from a very raw and honest pov and you either get sunk into that world or you don't but there's no dilly dallying there's no on oh, let's represent this rep no, no 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 we're going to represent one side of things only it's sort of sort of like the shield the shield is basically your view into what a police what a corrupt police force can look like and how that corruption can basically infect other people who have good intentions and it only viewed it from one pov only the wire was similar sort of way that way as well and how crime basically can infest all parts of life in a in a city somewhere right from the most lapidated area to the most like, rich and bougie area everyone got touched by some level of crime and by the after effects of it and i think succession has done a great work job of it too because it's singularly focused on this rich family and their bit and their kind of tv broadcasting business and how that effectively has affected the entire corporation and how it's affected other people that also kind of live within their orbit and the finale on season three was just really brilliant really 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 brilliantly done because it felt like everybody who'd been downtrodden everyone had been forgotten about everyone who basically was on the losing side suddenly with the exception of course of logan who seems to the only thing i'd have about you don't need again i'm, I'm going to spoil some bits so move on if you don't want to listen to it but there's gonna be some spoilers in here the only thing i'd say that's a slight issue i have with succession is that for whatever reason logan seems to always get away with it he always seems to be successful which again i think maybe is probably more representative of real life so as people say logan roy is sort of similar to like a robot robot sorry rupert murdoch in that respect so maybe that makes sense because there's been so many stones and so many eggs and whatever feel thrown at rupert murdoch being able to keep thriving so maybe that's a real life reflection of it but it does feel like there needs to come a point in time where he does suffer the consequences of his actions because they're essentially quite singularly driven right there's all about protecting himself and little about his family or his kids they're all sort of kind of an afterthought or even his employees just mostly focused on himself so there has to be a point in time where that kind of kind of come where that can come and bite him in the ass as it does with other characters every other person gets sort of like punished or humbled in a way and logan didn't really get punished or humbled yeah he had that heart attack thing yeah he had that little cheating thing where his wife kind of moved out of the home but come on let's let's be for real let's kind of drum it down a bit that you know everyone gets it in the end but still the end was just brilliant season three finale was just absolutely brilliant um this is an article courtesy of variety it says on succession balls on the floor inevitability um become the tyrants they once hated right and i'll read quickly the article here of course what is ahead it says here at the moment logan roy brian cox realizes his children are attempting to overthrow him he sizes them up snarls of disdain you bust in here guns in hand great line actually and now you find you've they've turned into sausages <laughs> it's a devastating blow made more devastating by the fact that logan has once again somehow found his own gun where they would have been a black hole but in the line that recalls an earlier equally brutal succession scene that proves equally crucial in the all bells say which seems these Roy kids uh, bust, sorry, bested by two men they never thought had it in them. In season two, The Hunting, written by creator Jesse Armstrong and Tony Roche, directed by the and an especially paranoid Rogan goes on a tear during a work retreat. Convinced that his, there's a mole in the midst, he gets his employees drunk and berates them with hostile questions about their loyalty. Eventually, inevitably, he identifies the weaker members of the herd, his hapless cousin Greg and bland lackey Carl and son-in-law Tom and makes them balls on the floor forcing them to oink for their sausage supper just because um so just because he says so as succession has shown time and time again logan roy didn't become logan roy without first conquering a game of ball on the floor born into the family that left his back um crisis cross so that left his back crisscross with scars to this day logan learned from early that in order to be the best his bullies he simply had to become the most fearsome bully of all and thus as emily vanderveff has written for vox the stories of logan roy his company and his children become stories of how abuse can shape and twist a person into starting the cycle all over again just so they can get some level of control over it why be the scorned peasant when you can be the tyrannical king choosing who lives who lives to serve you and who dies trying to stop you and that's basically what it is and again there's nothing wrong with that it's just the issue that his targets most of the time are his own children <laughs> that's the thing that's so fucked up about succession and what makes it so good 
it's fair enough that he's gone through this hard childhood that's kind of conditioned him and hardened him to be this kind of tyrannical, fearsome, you know, laser focused CEO that doesn't care about anybody else. But essentially, he's also led to him being in a place where he doesn't even care about his own kids. They're kind of an afterthought. No, there's no real love between them. It's just basically they're basically his employees that he kind of gives a little bit more of a leeway than he does any other person. But there's no real depth there to them. He probably treats his grandchildren better than he does his kids. When he's reading them books and stuff, you see a little bit of the softer side of him. But for the most part, they just get all snarl. It continues. Season three underlined the terrible potential of the boar evolving into a bully in a bold. One of the season's sharpest and hardest to watch threads saw Roman, um, Kinnan, sorry, Kieran Culkin, the Roy who may or may not have asked his family to lock him in a cage for fun as a kid, realizing how much fun it is to be a monstrous winner that's than a sore loser. The second Logan deigned to show him an ounce of respect, or dare he hope even affection, Roman hardened his heart to match his father's. He murdered Logan's tone, bombastic approach, mimicking his methods in Remain His Graces. He positioned a true blue fascist to become the Republican Party favorite, both because he didn't care for the concerned or considered the actual consequences, and because he saw a way to impress Logan with his ability to separate separate emotion from business when he finally literally pushes his brother kendall in front of the laughing crowd even his ruthless sister shiv can hardly believe just how completely robin embraces the belligerent armor that his father has wielded against them once forced to look at his once forced to look up to at his betters both literally and physically roman stature grows in both the narrative and meticulous direction as it transforms into a man who's forcefully put him in put him in his place having spent most of his life belittled dismissed and physically battered by his own person he so desperately wants to please of course roman would jump at the chance to flip the script given a chance yo and the actor that played roman I think I mentioned to somebody who's like a friend. I love the fact that, again, maybe it's just a little detail that I've noticed. But for whatever reason, Roman's quite twitchy. Maybe it's like an ADHD thing they've kind of given him. But he's got that sort of like recovered drug addict or drug addict sort of twitch where he's always twitchy, always nervous, always pulling at something, always scratching his hair, tucking his shirt into his trousers imaginarily, like it's, like it's been popped out, doing weird things. But if you think about it, you don't ever see him take drugs in the entire series apart from maybe one time, I think, when they're in a warehouse event somewhere. I don't think there's a single time where you actually see him take drugs. He drinks a lot. Most of the time he drinks and he spills out because he doesn't like it because it's not up to his kind of standards. But you don't actually see him taking any hard drugs really for the most part. It's just him just kind of acting like a bit of a crackhead, um, which I think is perfect acting. And again, of course, he's got this weird, nervous, sarcastic, cynical um tone about him consistently throughout the whole series it's just brilliant it works so good that sort of ambivalence and whatever it may be I, I love it all um still romans romans of roy and as such will always have a protection and higher status than the others can claim as the bookends of the hunting and all the bells say make excruciatingly clear the tom wang banks and gregory hirsch of the world have to fight harder dirtier and craftier to get out of the floor the entire series has led to the ultimate point of no return in all bells say written by armstrong but season three laid the groundwork for greg and tom's betrayal with masterful precision and again that was probably one of the best things because it was pretty brutal to see how shiv treats tom and to see how tom gets treated by the rest of the family which i think was basically learned behavior i think you've seen that a lot you've seen if logan roy treats you some way in public and people see it they usually then treat you the same way logan roy treats you in order to impress him and then we saw the same thing happen with shiv the fair way that shiv treats tom like an afterthought and like a bit of a cuck it's the same way everyone else treats him because they basically see that he doesn't wear the trousers in the in the company or in the relationship see i said company i even i got twang there but then it's sick to see that for whatever reason somehow i don't know how it changes or what happens because i think someone asked the director when did they think it switched for him but for whatever reason something switched in tom where he suddenly woke up and realized that he was getting taken advantage of because i think usually in those real life situations man or woman you just end up playing a position when you can't fight back enough or when you keep hitting a wall and you know there's nowhere to go for it. And especially if you kind of desire the things that these people desire in these sort of relationships, status, money, influence, whatever it may be. You might just think to yourself, you know what, it might just be a, it might be a, uh, it might be a, what's, it, what's that thing? Was it devil's bargain? I forgot what that term is called. But anyway, it might be a good deal to make to kind of put my morals my pride my ego my self-respect to one side in order for me to have again it's sad to say but a membership to this kind of members club uh, ability to go to this holiday and ability to stay in this job and this salary all these things are really important to these kind of lavishness because that's the thing as well the undercurrent of a succession that's really good 
Think about that scandal that happened with supposedly all this sexual abuse and rapes that happened in that cruise. They've been swept under a rug. They've kind of moved on with that really, really easily. Kendall killed a kid. Like, it doesn't really matter. So we don't really see it from the perspective of the kind of from the regular person from the outside we see it only from the perspective of the inside people of people and the corporations who only care about protecting their jobs who only care about protecting their holiday homes making sure their kids are able to go to private schools keeping up appearances making sure they can you know get into buildings have a, have a car pick them up that's what they care about they don't actually care about the morals the ethics the kind of the, the, the basically the pain that that whole process has basically run people through they basically let people go you know give them money to go away somewhere hide whatever it may be but there's no real real life consequences for that kind of heinous stuff that they do and a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're all trying to protect their own jobs they don't really care about doing right by these victims even you know what's his name Kendall is the same thing it's not as if he's trying to expose his family and basically get his dad fired or maybe put in prison because he's a good guy he's only doing it because he wants to be the boss he wants to be the the you know the the, the face of the new company wherever it may be so that's essentially what the position they're in and i think that's where they do really well in succession they never ever show you the other side they never show you the point of view from the protesters outside the building of waystar no one really gives a shit right they're just kind of muffled sounds in the background they're just telling you what's actually going on in the boardroom at boardroom level what are these guys and girls actually saying um, and how they're actually dealing with this real life consequence they don't circum they just kind of move on and skip it over it continues here says um the 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 Bonded as brothers in the Royal Jason arms, Tom and Greg took all the family's abuse until they could find their way above it. But in the Roy's grand tradition, abuse isn't a tunnel by cycle. Both Tom and Greg had outs, a divorce, a golden parachute. True, exactly. Tom could have left the divorce. Greg could have got that golden parachute, but again, they turned it down if they truly wanted to take them. Instead, they doubled down, bet the house and shook the whole out of the everyone but themselves. There's no such thing as an every man or in succession. So Tom and Greg are about as close as it Yes, McFadden and Brune are the tallest men in the castle. True, very true. I didn't realize that. And yet, the show continuously portrays them as constantly carrying a particular. It's a very good point. In front of the other figuratively demanding Roy's, Tom holds him. So, sorry, Tom folds himself to fit Shiv's needs. Greg's stature becomes a joke in and of itself. The moments when directors let them stand up and straight and truly look down on a Roy, as McFadden does so effectively in the diner parking lot to raise a skeptical eyebrow at Kendall, are as rare as they are purposely jarring tom and greg are both close enough to the roys without being con considered part of the family and when they allow themselves to feel the weight of their ambition they are more formidable than they even know crucially tom and greg also formed the show's most steadfast alliance early on and um, what began as a weird taunting banter became a somewhat um a something more don't sorry, sorry something more during hunting when tom chose not to expose greg and uh, joined him on the floor for everyone else to mock and dismiss as a useless nothing exactly um since then they have been the closest the show has to our true blue brothers keeping each other safe as bigger power players blustered above their heads and again i've always kind of loved that's why i think i kind of love greg as well because he is He's kind of the proverbial, I'm not meant to be here, but I'm going to act like it person. Um, he's gone kind of through so many crises of confidence, so many kind of imposter syndrome moments, but he's kind of steadfastly held on. And he's obviously adopted the speak, the mannerisms of the rich and the elites, right? Which obviously shows you it's a learned sort of behavior, right? You could easily become one of the elites or one of the one percenters as soon as you get put around them and you start seeing all the trappings and the kind of um, gifts and rewards you get given for just merely standing around these people. And he obviously worked out a way to do it. And again, with having no real, you know, family name or legacy or reputation to come with, just kind of a loose connection to the family, he's been able to make the most of it and you can't deny that. And of course, Tom got completely cucked out by his wife and Shiv, especially in front of the family. Family. they probably know what she gets up to in her private time and he still was able to kind of endure withdraw no sorry withdraw and endure sort of endure and withdraw one of those things and basically see out the other side it continues here it says a shiv refused to take tom seriously and kendall took greg for granted both did their best to get up every time they were kicked down and every time one did they found the other extending and helping hand it was greg who told tom about shiv's cheating in season one and tom who covered for greg in season two it was tom who did his best to keep greg out of jail when both of them seemed primed for their sacrificial slaughter and greg who enthusiastically joined tom's team minutes after shiv shrugs him off as an afterthought seeing the two of them shake hands in the finale 
Monday, dust cut into Roy's kids off at the knees, recalls the episode's early warning words from the tech giant Matson, who said, Here, two plebs recognize a kindred spirit in the other and work together to bring down the oblivious masters who assumed that they were harmless. Very true. Never take your opponent for granted, isn't it? I think, um, what's her name? Amanda Nunes obviously learned that lesson over the weekend against Lima. To end it here, said Tom and Gregor's victory isn't yet complete, as Tom told Greg while inciting him enticing him to make a deal with the devil. They're now in a solid position at the top of the bottom, but the Roy's Logan included would be better to pay more attention to the boars on the floor who are more incentive than any one blindsided careless tyrant. And let's see that scene where Tom comes back in and you see the door ajar and Shiv notices how nicely he is his dad kind of embraces him she realizes right then that okay he's the one that betrayed me but she can't be mad either because again she took the piss out of him for the entirety of their relationship so she knows what the deal is in it she knows what the deal is and again succession is fucking amazing if you haven't watched it already please do check it out great series again i was somebody that wasn't necessarily sold on it to begin with i was one of the doubters one of the haters and i've definitely come around to it over the last couple of months i've definitely come around to it